We're joined now by Erwin Tan, Professor at Han Cook University of Foreign Studies. Professor Tan, good morning. Thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us today. I want to start by asking you about Blinken. He's in China. Uh, and, you know, even as he's there, aid is starting to make its way to Ukraine, to Taiwan, and, and, and also Israel. Now, these are all issues on the Secretary of State's agenda. My question is, are they going to complicate his efforts to smooth ties and in his talks with Chinese officials? Well, for sure, because um, if you consider the mainland's ambition to absorb Taiwan under its control, the prospect of increased U.S. military aid to Taiwan is the one thing that will be able to thwart such a mainland endeavor. Now, if you see the kind of uncanny parallels between Taiwan to China and Ukraine to Russia, you can see that those two issues are very heavily interlinked. All the more so given the extent to which the Biden administration has sought to identify his legacy in safeguarding democracy against authoritarian regimes. And I think a further challenge then is the issue of Israel. Because if you consider the nature of um, Israel's disproportionate use of force in Gaza and therefore leading to a backlash against traditional democratic leading voters, the risk is that it then ends up splitting the vote between Biden and Trump in November of this year. So it makes the outcome of the U.S. elections very uncertain in that sense. Mm -hmm. Professor, if we could just delve into that sharp divide on the issue of China's support for Russia. Uh, there are reports that the uh, U.S. is drafting sanctions on some Chinese banks for helping Moscow at war. Uh, what are the chances of Beijing complying with the demands? How do you expect them to react? I suspect that China is likely to give in to U.S. pressure in some areas, especially those where it's hard for China to avoid scrutiny. Because um, one thing to bear in mind is that China is very worried currently about the uh, state of the economy because um, you are no doubt aware of the so-called Tang Ping or lying flat phenomenon, the increasing disillusionment that many young Chinese have. So the last thing that Xi Jinping wants right now is a so, um, damage to the Chinese economy because that is the risk to the CCP's regime legitimacy. Mm. Professor, Now that said, uh, China still has a shared... Yeah. Oh, please go on, please go on. Yes? Please go on. Oh, yes. That said, China has a shared interest in keeping up its increasing cooperation with Russia. Because from the Chinese point of view, the most efficacious way of getting of absorbing Taiwan is to have the U.S. bogged down in Eastern Europe. So by supporting the Russian war effort in Ukraine, this helps to di di disperse U.S. attention and make it harder for the U.S. to concentrate on shoring up Taiwan in that sense. So it's a very uneasy a frenemy sort of relationship between China and Russia and North Korea for that matter. Professor Tan, just want to ask you about the state of current yes. relations. We know that Anthony Blinken is there after a series of high-level interactions. There was a call between Xi and Biden. Janet Yellen was there, you know, about two weeks ago. The, the US and Chinese defense chiefs have also spoken recently. So has this relationship stabilize? Would you even go as far to say that ties have actually improved? Um, they have moved, they have improved by a one or two steps up in the sense that no one really has an, a real interest in seeing all-out war between the US and China. Both knows there's mutual suicide. So there's that much level of stabilization, but it's still very narrowly defined and the, and the challenge is in sustaining such a measures reducing tensions because Indeed. both sides are basically one or two steps above a zero-sum game. I mean, they don't, neither side has an interest in all-out war, but the scope for cooperation is still very narrowly limited. Indeed, Professor. And of course, the prime talking point during Blinken's visit could be China's concern over that fresh aid package for Taiwan, which Beijing warned is entering a very dangerous situation. How do you envision both sides to navigate this very sensitive and controversial issue? Is there a logical endpoint to this? Yes. Um, well, since the uh, passing of the Taiwan Relations Act in 1979, the US has, it has allowed the U.S. to run transfers of defensive armaments to Taiwan. So what the U.S. has consistently done is to provide armaments to Taiwan, but not the latest items. 
So, for instance, say the F-16s, for instance, um, the F-16 first entered service in the U.S. Air Force in the 1970s, but Taiwan did not get hold of those until the 1990s. So in the present context, the fighter aircraft that Taiwan really wants is the F-35 stealth fighter, and I think we can bet that the U.S. is not going to give those. Other uh, high-end items that would enable Taiwan to launch direct attacks on China, the mainland are also going to be off the list. Effectively, a kind of an unspoken quid pro quo between China, the U.S. and China. So basically, the U.S. is prepared to send the kind of weapons that Taiwan will need to defend its own territory, but not to be able to attack China as a mm. very uh, as a means of trying to straddle that line of strategic ambiguity. Well, Prof Tan, China is well aware this is an election year in the United States. So I I'm I'm curious, what will it do between now and November? Will it actually try to improve things, uh, and you know have to and, and possibly see a new leader in place, or is it just going to da dance around the fringes and wait till there's absolute clarity? Well, China's in a bit of a tough spot with both Trump and Biden, seeing as it is that. Uh, it's this really weird situation in which China has had, had had to do with Trump in the past and China remembers the trade war with Trump. But Biden is also taking a rather tough line against China. So in that sense, it's probably in China's interest to try to improve relations with the US to minimize the likelihood of the post-2024 White House in adopting a confrontational posture towards Beijing. But that's it. The kind of posture that China adopts is itself dependent on who ends up in the White House. Because in the case of Trump, Trump is basically playing to his domestic base of dissolution, Rust Belt uh, working classes who felt angry about you know economic restructuring resulting from cheap Chinese imports. Whereas Biden is taking a more uphold democracy um, sort of agenda for his legacy. So in this sense, Trump and Biden are approaching the issue of relations with China from different angles, even though it does lead to the same outcome in adopting a tough posture against China. So China is, uh, un is itself uncertain about who is going to win, so it's likely going to be dancing around the edges but trying to minimize the possibility of a long-term confrontation. Then, Professor, can I ask, which presidency do you think is in Beijing's interest if they had to choose? Well, I'm thinking that uh, by from Be from Beijing's point of view, this is my opinion, which could be wrong. From Beijing's point of view, I would say that Biden is the less uh, threatening to Chinese interests, mm. because the risk with Trump is that he's, um, let's say, unpredictable enough to be willing to risk uh, all-out confrontation. We saw that with the uh, trade war with China, the threats to turn up, uh, you know unleash uh, fire and fury in North Korea back in 2017. So the kind of recklessness, if you put that within the context of US-China relationship, is uh, going to be a lot more severe and more dangerous and unpredictable than a Biden administration. So I would say that they would prefer Biden, however, reluctantly. Okay, that makes complete sense. We do have to leave it there, Professor Tan. Appreciate your time and your thoughts. We have been talking to Erwin Tan, Professor at Hankook University of Foreign Studies.